Okay, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first session of this morning. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Hodge, and I am the Interop Engineer for the OpenStack Foundation, and with me today is Catherine Dieppe, who is the Solutions Architect and Performance Engineer at IBM. And today we're going to be talking about how to configure your cloud in Tempest for interoperability testing. So why test? Right? Like OpenStack already has a gate and it's already thoroughly tested. So why should you test your own cloud? Well, when you deploy your OpenStack cloud, you actually want to make sure that you know, you know, you want to know if your cloud works as you expected it to. Um, I've seen this before in my own installations where everything looks fine, I can log into the console, and I can boot up machines and I can do all sorts of things, but there are services that um, say they're enabled, but may or may not actually be enabled, and, and I don't know they're actually not working until a user comes up and tells me that they're not using. So testing helps you determine that your cloud works as expected and all the features that you want to be there are actually there. It's also good to test your, your running cloud to make sure that it's still healthy. You don't know if services have come in and out, if something is if, if, if something has crashed, and testing gives you an early warning on when something isn't there anymore. And so it's important to kind of learn how to test your cloud and the sort of tests that you want to run and the, ex and the expected results. This also this goes double for an upgrade. You know, if you're going from Icehouse to Juno to Kilo, there are certain things you want to do to make sure that your upgrade worked as expected. You know, again, just because you have Horizon running or your APRs are running doesn't necessarily mean that your services are um, working as you would expect. Um, but one of the reasons, and this is, this is also becoming a more important reason for um, all sorts of users, especially those who are selling a commercial OpenStack product, is does your product qualify for a logo? Um, there were recent changes to, uh, to, the, uh, to the foundation bylaws, which now actually require that your clouds pass some sort of interoperability testing if you want to attach an OpenStack-powered an OpenStack logo to it. Mm -hmm. This initiative is called DEFCORE. So DEFCORE Interoperability in You. Uh, a committee was formed during the OpenStack Icehouse Summit in Hong Kong uh, by, board, you know, by a board resolution in November of 2013. Um, the DEF Corps committee has uh, established principles and artifacts that are required for clouds to be able to qualify for, for, for the OpenStack logo. Um, this includes a designate, designated sections of code, and so to be called OpenStack, you actually have to be running OpenStack. Um, most notably, the designated sections cover uh, Nova and Swift, so you need to be running Nova and you need to be running Swift. Um, it also defines um, a, must, a set of must-pass tests, which are meant to measure different capabilities. And so a test might be testing something like, can I boot a virtual machine? Can I destroy a virtual machine? Can I create a swift object? Um, you know, these, are, these are the sort of things that we expect to, for, for clouds to have. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that these, that these definitions are actually done in a community-defined process. We want to seek a lot of feedback from the users, from the, from the community of developers, from the community of users, from the community of vendors. Um, and make sure we incorporate all of that feedback into how we're defining the process so that, we're def so that how we're defining OpenStack reflects the needs of the community. One of the ways that we do this is RefStack, and I'm gonna have uh, Catherine talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Chris. So now you know that you need to test. And now you know that that courts already define a set of criteria that, that you need to measure upon. Um, one of the things uh, that the uh, RefStack project is for is to realize all the goals that were set forward by uh, Dev Core committee. And by providing the tools that will help this journey to be easier. So uh, basically, RefStack uh, implement all the use case that was divided by DevCourt. With that, RefStack, there's three parts of RefStack. One of the, uh, the first part is what we call it, uh, RefStack client. It's actually a wrapper for uh, the test tool that will be used that you need to test on. Currently, the test tool is we are using Tempest. In the future, it can be evolving with using many other type of test tool. So, at, so therefore, we have a common point, RefStack 
uh, client to wrap around all these test tools to give out the uniform result that can be interpreted consistently across all the tools. That is RevStack uh, client. And with that, once you collect all the data, what do you do with that data? So there is a RevStack API server that in the future will be probably in infra, uh, set up in infra, and all these data will be sent to that server. That server will be a, re re a repository for all these data, and then all the analysis tool and et cetera can be done there. What is useful with uh, all these data and nowhere, n not a good way to look at it? Therefore, we have this RevStack UI. Uh, there's different aspects of RevStack UI. Uh, at this moment, RevStack uh, UI, or when you uh, send the data, we collect data anonymously at this moment, so that all data, no one knows who that data belongs to, only the sender knows that data. What we want to do right now is to collect the statistic, do data analysis of what are the most basic common uh, element or component or implementation that are common for the whole ecosystem of OpenStack ecosystem out there. So uh, with that, later we'll have a demo. At the end of that, we'll have a demo of the RevStack UI. Uh, and, and, and we can walk you through how uh, all the artifact that was defined by DevCore and how does it imply, uh, imply to your uh, uh, data. And with that, let's get into the first set. So now, installation. As we say, at this moment, the test tool behind RevStack or is Tempest. Tempest is well known um, to the technical community. So for installation, if you would like to use Tempest directly today, you can. And therefore, you can uh, install Tempest uh, um, manually using the Tempest um, instructions. However, in Rev, RevStack client, uh, provide one, what we call one-click tools, mm -hmm. uh, with a, a setup, um, with a setup tool, that it will take care of all your dependency. It will install all the dependencies that Tempest need, and also install Tempest. And um, so, so with that, you will just know that uh, you can uh, even even that you want to test Tempest directly you can, from, from this point, go into a directory uh, that RevStack already include templates, which is the .tempest directory, and operate as running Tempest by itself. Or you can use testr or whatever. Um, the other uh, option is you can also using RevStack clients directly. The difference between running Tempest directly and running uh, RevStack clients is running Tempest, then your result will be in subunit format. And you need to run through certain kind of uh, uh, data processor of, to format it in a way that you can understand. When you use REST for that client, it will process to a very simple and uh, uh, JSON at this moment um, that only includes all the past tests. Um, that's all it includes, and, and, and a few identity. For example, what Keystone ID, we use that as a, your cloud uh, uh, ID to identify who are this cloud that's sending this data to. For this tool, sending the passing is important because we don't differentiate you are not passing because you failed the test or the test is being skipped. So there's no differentiation. The, 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 the goal here is know what are the common characteristics of the ecosystem. Okay, Chris will. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about first is what the ways that you need to actually configure your cloud to, pre to prepare it for testing. Uh, there are certain assumptions that you have that you need to have in place in order to have a minimally viable cloud. Um, these include user accounts. And so right now for testing, you need, at a minimum, two test users from two different tenants. 
This allows for the testing of a number of different basic operations like creating virtual machines and making sure they can attach to networks, um, but also making sure that users, a user from one tenant can't actually see the resources that are being created by another tenant. We also need two images that are installed to your cloud. Now, uh, it can be the same image uploaded twice. Um, but you can't use the same image reference twice. A uh, number of tests will actually be skipped if you try to use the same image. Um, and we suggest that you use Cirrus. It's about 13 megabytes in size right now. It's a Linux distribution. It's very tiny. It's fast to boot up. And it gives you all of the tools that you need to be able to test booting, networking, replication, all these things, you know, attaching volumes. And so, it's a really nice image to use, and it's open source and publicly available, and that's actually what the, the gate is using right now, too. You're going to need networks, because there's, you can't do anything with a virtual machine if you have no way to get to it. Uh, so you have a couple of options here. One is to create a, a, a shared network that is visible to all of the tenants, and then all of the machines will be able to connect to that. Um, another option is to create one network per tenant. And, and so, you know, the, you know, in this way, you're enforcing an isolation between the networks also. Um, you know, and this is nice if you are, you know, if this is the way that you've configured your cloud to bring up, uh, you know, a new tenants is that they automatically get their own network so they can't see one another. Um, you also need to know what your member role is. Uh, you know, that, that by default, what is the role that all of the users have that enable them to access your, the, the cloud in a, in a non-privileged way? Um, this role needs to be assigned to all of the test users. Um, uh, uh, optionally, you also need, uh, you might need a third user that has an administrator role if you want to take advantage of the more advanced features of Tempest. Um, right now, there are, you know, there are well over a thousand tests that are running inside of Tempest. Uh, um, you, you know, we, we, are, we are running as much, we're interested in a much smaller subset of that, the API Tempest tests. And um, some of those tests require administrator access, some don't. If you're just running the dev core tests, then you actually don't need to have administrator access. Uh, that's, that's part of the requirement of those tests. But you know, to encourage everybody to you know, really get a full coverage of their cloud and get a sense of what they're doing, we actually encourage you to try to run as many of the tests as possible. Um, you know, and so in this case, it's also nice to have an administrator role. Um, and finally, you need to know the role that your, that your Swift operator has. Oftentimes, this is the member role. Sometimes it can be configured to be something else. But this is, you know, this is so that, you know, again, you need a user that has the ability to create and destroy Swift objects and containers. Um, so that was how you need to, you know, kind of the basics that you need behind your cloud to be able to start testing against it. But then, once you, once, you, once you have your cloud ready, then you need to configure Tempest. Uh, and so there are four basic things that you need to worry about when you're configuring Tempest. The first is what services are enabled. And so you're, you may be interested in testing a whole wealth of services from Keystone to Nova and Cinder, all the way out to Trove and Sahara. Um, or you may be running a more basic cloud. You may be just be running Swift, and you're interested in just testing object storage. And so in that case, you would turn off networking and, and compute. Um, and these are just simple flags inside of your Tempest configuration file. And we'll get to those a little bit later. Um, you also have the endpoints. And so you actually need to know exactly where your cloud is running and, and which of those endpoints are publicly available for your test suite to interact with. And so if you have privileged access to your cloud, that may be a different set of endpoints that you have enabled versus if you are a user looking at evaluating someone else's cloud and you want to run the non-administrator tests against that. You need to know the endpoints. And once you have your endpoint, you need to know the credentials for logging in. And so what are the names, the tenants, and the passwords of the users? Um, and finally, you need the assets that we described earlier. You need to know what those are and oftentimes how they're configured. And so these are network IDs, network names, Image, name, image IDs and image names. You know, so these are kind of the basic things that you're going to have to set up in Tempest.com from the configuration parameters you're going to have to look for. Um, Tempest.com can be a little daunting because there are hundreds of options. But when you kind of narrow it down to, 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 these, uh, to these base things that you're looking for, it helps you realize that, oh, actually, a lot of the default settings are OK. And, uh, um, 
And there was a new document that was published just a few, I think a, a month or two ago, uh, by Matthew Trenish in the OpenStack QA team um, called the Tempest Configuration Guide. Um, this is publicly available at docs.openstack.org as part of the developer documentation. Um, at a high level, it actually covers kind of the three ways that you can set up the users and assets. You can use stored credentials in tempest.conf. This is the original way. Um, you know, this is part of the proliferation of options that are available. You can also use a new mechanism called locking accounts, where you create an account file that kind of contains all this information and the resources that are available to users and their credentials. Um, this is actually a really nice way to run tests, especially if you, uh, if you don't have administrator access, but you do, have, but you do know the account settings. Um, and finally, you can also use stored credentials in tempest.conf with tenant is isolation. Tenant isolation assumes that you have administrator privileges. One of the benefits of this is you can run your tests in parallel. It's going to create a user and resources for every test that it wants to run, and it's going to run it up to some, cert to some number of threads. The downside to this is you need administrator access to be able to do this. So for our talk today, there's going to be an assumption that you don't necessarily have administrator access, and so we're not going to cover the third option. We're just going to talk about the stored credentials in tempest.conf and the locking accounts. But the takeaway message is, if you are going to be running Tempest, this is essential reading. And, and so we strongly recommend that you go look at this. It's very well written, um, and it gives you a lot of information and insight into how the tests run. Okay. So now you have the overview of what you need to uh, configure. I will step you into uh, the few very specific cases. One of the first one is when, when you install Tempest, you have a Tempest sample config file. Uh, that file is very useful. It has the uh, default setting that's set in there, commented out, but if you don't set it, that is what being set in there in, in your, uh, it, during the test. So I strongly recommend it that if you ever need to edit this Tempest config file, you add whatever your configuration parameter in addition to the default there. Don't just uncomment the comment and then, and then configure your parameter. Because leaving the configuration, the default configuration in there will help you tremendously to understand some of the pain that like we, we have had uh, down the road. Uh, one of the, so, so the, the takeaway is if you, if one of the configuration is so important for you, set it. Even that when you set it, the value is the same like the default value, set it anyway. One of the things that was changing from Icehouse to Juno is the allow tenants, uh, allow tenant isolation flag. It was default to false before, but later was default to true. And that throw us off. Why, why does it, the system, the same configuration that work differently? So that is one of the best uh, lessons that we have learned. If the configuration parameter is important to you, set it. Um, enabling service, uh, 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 Chris, uh, talk about that. Some people use neutron networks, some people use heat. So configure it to the way that uh, your cloud will operate. Again, we can't emphasize enough that if you are able to please test the whole test suite, that will help the data. The data is so important for us to define the the, 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 the common component for the whole ecosystem, and that nothing more than data-driven uh, capability definition. Rather than someone define, here's the capability. If we have that data, we will be able to define with confidence, reliable, that this will work for the whole communities. User account, Chris also talked about that. There is, uh, uh, for, uh, Tempest have about uh, 1,600 API tests. In, uh, in the last release. So uh, if you would really ex want to exercise all the tests, the admin credential is needed. But when DevCore trying to define the capability, we're not, we try to avoid from admin, we try to, and we try to val see the value of interoperability and, and not every user will have admin. But 
for data collection, uh, please do that. And if you do that, then you will need to use the unlocking account setting me mechanism. But that is not needed for uh, what we call certification, but it's, it's highly encouraged. Image, we talk about, you need two images. It can be the same image, but we need two image IDs. Okay, network, one of the one that you can configure very easily is the fixed network. If you use this parameter, then one of the thing, the downside is you lose that isolation, network isolation. But uh, because all the user, all your test user need to be able to have visibility to this network. Again, that is a choice and uh, depend on, on, on what your network configuration is. Log file very important. The default is empty. So if you, if you run the test and, and you, you was wondering where the log file is, you should set the log file. The same as log path. Resizing. Uh, resizing is default to false. And it so happened that some of the tests in the current capability specification involve some of the resizing uh, test cases. So if you do not test this one, you do not set this parameter, you, all these tests will be skipped. And then from passing point of view, we do not know whether this is skipped or, or failed. So if it is important, set it. Um, endpoint type. Tempest was designed to test in DevStack uh, environment. And, and the next level up is, uh, is a distri distribution. You can build a, a cloud using that distribution. You can build it with whatever way that, that you, you, you want to build. But when you go to a public cloud, there is certain way that the public cloud is built. You cannot work around that. One of the thing is the endpoint. Some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the keystone UI might not be able to access uh, externally, uh, sometimes you might need to set it differently. So pay attention to this parameter. Adapt it to your cloud. Right. And, 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 and something to note here is that when, you, when we say a public URL versus internal URL and the, and the options that are, that are found here, these typically refer to the types of URLs that you would find in the Keystone catalog. And so, if you, and so if you run the Keystone command line and type Keystone catalog, you'll see these names, internal, public URL, coming up. And you can get a sense of what URLs are going to be available to your testing and what, which aren't yeah. going to be available. Right. So, sorry. Thank you. That's it. So now, volume. People build uh, your VM differently. Not everyone just have one disk. Some have uh, a, 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 a OS disk and also have data disk, system disk, data disk. So if you happen to have the defaults is when you do a, uh, when you add a disk, the default volume is uh, um, VDB. And if you already have one in there, your test case will fail. So, so know your environment, what kind of configuration, what kind of VM you are building, then adapt it uh, to that. These are the, the lessons that we have learned. And, and the role in Swift, people might have, my label a different role, their policy will be differently. So, so just pay attention to these parameters. So as an alternative to setting you know, your, you know, your account values directly, you can also use locking accounts. Um, one of the benefits of locking accounts is you know, where if you set your credentials in the Tempest.com directly, then you're forced to run Tempest serially, um, you know, in, in less, unless you're using tenant isolation. Locking accounts gives you a middle ground. It allows you, if you have some number of accounts created, um, but you don't necessarily have administrator access so that you can, so that you can generate these, you know, the, the, these accounts programmatic, programmatically with Tempest, um, then you can use locking accounts. Um, the idea is within Tempest, you create an accounts.yaml file, um, and, you, and you set the test account file parameter to, to match that file. Mm -hmm. um, then you, so by setting that parameter, you're, you are telling Tempest, hey, look at this accounts file to, to find the, the accounts that we need. Um, in conjunction, you also have to set allow tenant isolation equal to false because if it's set to true, Tempest will roll into default into tenant isolation and start trying to use your administrator credentials for that. 
Um, you can configure accounts.yaml with a set of pre-created users and the resources that are available to them. And so this is a nice way, too, that if you have images or networks or anything else that a user might need, but they're going to be isolated within those tenants, you can directly specify what those are. And so if you remember previously, we talked about having one private shared network. Well, if you don't have a, a single private shared network, you can create individual private networks for every one of your tenants and use that parameter to access them. So, and now that you've done this, for every two accounts you create, you can, one, you can run one Tempest thread. And so if you have eight accounts, you can run four threads in Tempest and in, increase the performance of your test run. Um, right now, if you do a full API Tempest run, it takes uh, about two. an hour and a half, two hours? Two hours. Two hours. If you do a full dev core run, it's going to take about 10 minutes. Yeah. And so if you're doing a smaller dev core run, it may not be important. But if you're actually you know, you know, testing in production and iterating and trying to do this quickly, being able to run your Tempest test in parallel is actually a very valuable tool. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, Every user needs their own tenant, or a Tempest will behave in strange ways. Um, there, may be two, there may be a race condition involved where it wants to you know, create, create virtual machines and then list the virtual machines and help them to make sure that you know, they destroyed properly and they didn't. And if, you're and if your users are sharing the same tenant, those tests could interfere in ways that are um, undefined. Um, and again, you know, talking about you, know, you can either use the one shared network if it's available, or you can define your own network names. <laughs> Um, and one thing that's important, too, is if you have non-standard Swift roles, um, you actually need to use the locking accounts so that you can start defining. Um, the, uh, the Tempest configuration guide has a little bit more information about this, um, but if you're running container tests, you actually uh, are more likely to need to use the locking accounts configuration. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're, if you're having trouble with your container tests, that could be the reason why. I mean, you're not a container in a, a Swift object storage. And so here's an example of what the locking accounts file looks like. You give it a username, a tenant name, a password, the resources that are available to it, um, and the roles that might be assigned to the user that, that, uh, that Tempest should be looking for. So it's a pretty simple file format. Um, it's yet another file format to look at. Uh, um, so now you have Tempest configured. And, um, we should keep in mind that this is actually going to be an iterative process for you. The first time you run Tempest, you're going to run it, and you're going to say, why are things breaking? What's going on? Um, so you're probably going to have to go back and twiddle some of the configuration parameters to match your cloud, um, you know, change things you, you might have overlooked. And this is natural. Everyone goes through it. Uh, but there are a variety of ways to initiate a Tempest run. Um, uh, one thing to keep in mind here, too, is that there's actually an assumption that uh, after you've installed all of the Tempest tools, and I didn't capture this in the slides, but I'll, I'll make sure that I, the, the slides we upload for the presentation are capture this. Um, you want to run Tempest in a virtual environment, uh, and so there's a .venv inside of the Tempest directory. If you're going to use test or run, you're going to have to activate that virtual environment. And if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, so if you're familiar with Python virtual environments, it, it's uh, you source um, an activate file that's, that's within the .vn bin directory. Um, so there's something to keep in mind. Tester is the Python testing framework that is used to run the tests. And so that will, um, they will kind of look at the standard Python unit testing format. There are other test tools that you can use to do this. OpenStack and the OpenStack QA team prefer tester. Um, uh, so you can just do tester run, and it's going to run all of the tests. Um, we also, there's also a, uh, a run Tempest script that is provided by the Tempest team, which um, you know, lets you run it with a custom configuration file. Um, you can also load a custom list of tests uh, using either run Tempest or uh, tester using the minus load list option. Um, this is nice if you want to, say, run just the dev core tests. Uh, you provide a, a very exacting list of tests, and it's just going to run every one of those. If it finds, if it, if the test is in the list and it can't find it in the, your test repository, it's going to skip that test silently. Um, so it's pretty important to build that list off of whatever the current version of Tempest is. Um, and you can get that by running uh, tester list tests. 
Um, this is part of the tester documentation too, which is worth looking at. Um, you can also uh, restrict your test run to a search string. And so, for example, if you want to run all of the Tempest API tests, the easiest way to do it is to just pass dash dash Tempest API to run Tempest. Um, and that's going to only run tests who match, whose prefix matches Tempest.API, and it's going to ignore, ignore everything else. And, you know, and so the load list and the, uh, and, the, and the pattern matching format are two, two very powerful tools that keep you from running uh, you know, hours and hours of tests within, within Tempest. And so you know, it's important to um, you know, keep those in mind as you're running tests. Finally, after you've run the tests, you're going to want to interpret the test results. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of output flying by if you use Run Tempest. It's actually going to give you a nice view of your tests as they come out and you know, tell you what passed and failed and what the fastest and slowest test was. Um, but actually, all of the output from the tests, the kind of the raw output, is stored in a .test, rep test repository directory. Um, every time you run Tempest, it's going to create a new file. The files are just numeric, increasing. Um, and the format is called subunit, and we have lots of tools for parsing it, and they're all going to be available in your virtual environment that you're running Tempest in. Um, subunit isn't the easiest format to read. It is text, but there's, um, there's a lot of data, and it's a little bit messy. Um, but you can create easier to read formats, like um, you can use subunit two to one to two to convert it to convert the format to subunit two, and then subunit two to CSV to produce a comma separated list of tests. So you can kind of look at things. You also want to make sure you look at the logs. If things go wrong, there are going to be log. You want to check the logs because it's going to have your Python stack traces and all sorts of information about the tests. Um, but another nice way to run, the ref, uh, run Tempest is with the REST stack client, and uh, Catherine's going to talk a little bit about that. OK. So again, um, we are running short on time. I, I try to go so fast so that yeah. I can show the demo. The, the important thing is the demo. So the slide, uh, so you can run Tempest. You can run, uh, you can run Tempest with REST stack, and with, you can run specific test in a file like we say here or run you just say run ref stack it will run all the api test once you run the test uh, as we say before the result is the subunit in subunit format you either need to pass it the way that we have shown you a few two earlier or you can uh, if you run by tempest by default we pass it for you to a json file that is readily to upload to the ref stack api so once you uh, upload, then uh, now we can go to the UI and look at the data. So here is the refstack.net. You should be able to, uh, to, from your computer, and look at that. And that is the, uh, the website. So once you go into there, you can click on one of the test results. For example, look at this page. Um, on, on one of the lines there, you can see that this is your, the duration of your test. This is what being tested about 10 minutes or so, and the total pass of this test run is 88. So this test run probably just run the uh, dev code the file test. And then one of the things that you can look into here is the specification. Right now, DevCore have three specification, uh, 2015.5, uh, .4, So it depending on what release and what specification you want to test around. So you click on that. And then uh, the specification uh, uh, describe or, or include what are the capability that you need to pass or need to pass that, that they think is the common capability in there. That is where these things, uh, um, these, this area is the capability that currently defined in this specification. Not only that, OpenStack give you several ways for uh, because you might be a vendor that only do object store. It doesn't make sense for you to install all the other projects. So therefore, the, the licensing 
right now, licensing or program right program, now. Yeah. Yeah. There's a three level of program. There is a OpenStack power platform. That's the one that have everything, whatever capability that- Compute is and storage. App, yeah. And then the other one is compute, currently only compute storage. If you have both compute storage, then it will be platform. But if you only have storage, then it will be power storage, et cetera. So you can then looking at uh, some of the tests. You see some of the tests pass, some of the tests fail, and depending on the, uh, the specification, if we go to 04, then you see that, you see that little flag there? That is the feedback from the community that a lot of people are not passing this test. So, so there's a, some flag test there that the, the dev core team, uh, people, etc., will have to take a closer look on these tests. I want to show you a test run. If you go back to this one and go to the last page, yeah, the second one up. This is a test run that you can see that the number of pass tests is 1,200. This is what we would encourage you to do, test as much as you can. Send us the data, although that capability is the same because we're currently uh, only 100 or so test case. But with this number of test data in there, we will be able to define the next type of capability coming in. We will be able to know what percentage of the community have this one passed, for example. So uh, you can go to refstack.net, play with it, and tell us what you think. Your feedback, your involvement in the RefStack project is surely welcome by all of us. We need, we need more help. Right, and so why run RefStack? It's a simple result collection for, you know, you can, it's, a, it's a tool for collecting and reviewing results. It's an anonymous way to share your capabilities of your cloud, and so you can actually report back, and nobody is going to be able to look at it and say, oh, product X, you are not yep. working because of, because of this reason. Um, it helps us to discover the most widely used features and define what interoperability means. Like, community feedback on interoperability is so important. Um, so run all of the Tempest API tests, not just DevCore, and report them to RefStack. Um, your results make a difference, and the RefStack tool wouldn't be here if it weren't for the efforts of um, Catherine, but also uh, David Lenwell uh, was the PTL David of the here. project from the beginning, um, and has put a lot of effort into making RefStack a really successful tool that we're going to be able to use for interoperability testing. So we'd like to say thank you to him for that, mm -hmm. um, you know, as well as all the other developers. Um, and uh, We're on time. thank you. Uh, do you have any uh, questions? Yes, uh, and please uh, use the microphone in the middle of the room so that we can capture your questions for the the video. Hey, do you have any support for multiple availability zones for Nova and Cinder? At the at the moment, the concentrate is on API interoperability. I mean, definitely that will be an area that we have to evolve to, but at this moment, not yet. But yeah, and you know, and, and to that end, typically what we're looking for is if you if you have a cloud that if a testing cloud that captures that it captures the essential capabilities of your deployment cloud, you know, but is but is in some ways simplified, like you know, it may not may only have one availability zone. Um, you know, as far as the DevCore standard goes, we would still accept those test results. Yep. I think this is a very, still a very early stage, and community involvement is very important. Hey guys, uh, perhaps my question is similar to the gentleman before. I'm, I'm doing um, volume migration in Cinder, so I was planning to add some tests into Tempest. For example, I would like to migrate volume from LVM to store uh, to IBM back, and is that possible to do the test in Tempest? Uh, so, so the OpenStack QA team is, it's like any other project with an OpenStack. It's, it's, it's open, it's a community of developers, and you, you know, anybody is welcome to, to, to join and contribute. And so, I mean, I think the, the answer to that question is best answered by the, by the OpenStack QA community. 
Um, uh, the PTL of that, of that project is Matthew Trenish. Um, they meet in the OpenStack QA IRC room and have weekly meetings. Um, so I'm, think, I'm sure you should be able to write a test. How you would be able to do that and get that integrated right. is, is better answered by them. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.